She's one of the magnificent 11. She's one of the first inaugural justices of the court. People like me, Justice Noble and Justice Yakub and a few others were really those who came after the initial and foundational justices of our court. They wrote their heart out to create a new jurisprudence that was going to lay down the high values of our society. Some suggested that because she was an academic, that is not the normal route to get to the highest court in a country. They're wrong. They're plainly wrong. It's helpful to practice law and to gain sound knowledge of procedural law as you do that and forensic experience. But it's quite another when you get to the apex court where taxonomy and a deep understanding of the law and its philosophy becomes much, much more fundamental. Because then you set the trend. You don't set the small stuff. Every time you go over the set of facts, you seek to extract from those facts trends in law that would make society better, that would enhance governance, rule of law, and justice. And she came to the court after a career as a professor in academics and stayed on, as I say, for a solid 15 years in the glorious company, sometimes endless, of Arthur Jaskelson as Chief Justice of the Court, and indeed Ishmael Mohammed as the Deputy Head of the Court. So she and said, while wow, Sidney Kentridge acted as a Justice of the Court. So we have a primal justice that she's a woman is by the way. Now we share the one thing because we speak the same whole language and about that I'm deeply proud. And those who pronounce them Mokoro and Makaro should have listened properly to Mokoro. And that's the only way to pronounce it, no other. I invite you to go and look at the law reports of our country but an unfailing period of 15 years, she has wrote her heart out. And she is cited and quoted in our course continuously. But above all, it is that keen, deep sense of a just society. The fact that we have to create and continue to create a just society. She's going to speak for herself in a moment. If anything, I leave you just with one thought. Let's create an ecosystem. I won't call them resistant movements, I'll call them social movements. Because at some point, if you go on straight like this, all of us will have to rise. It's inevitable, unless we self-correct. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the city and the city.
former Deputy Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, the Kanu Seneke, I am not good with protocols. I always have this fear that I might leave out some names. Uh, so I will ask you to be kind to me and allow me to proceed um, without um, getting into the protocols. Suffice to say, I recognize you all. I acknowledge you all. I uh, start with the resource family and uh, am eternally grateful for the honor that uh, you have placed on me associated with your dad's um, name and work. The LRC, thank you so much for this honor. I appreciate it, I'm humbled by it, and the particular humility I feel is to be associated with uh, George Bissot's, a man who oozes, allow me to speak about him in the presence, in the present tense, oozes with humility. Respect for this, you know, unassuming, unassuming posture. It is an honor to be associated with him through this uh, award. Thank you so much to all of those people who nominated me for the award if there was such a procedure and who felt that. I am worthy to be associated with George Jesus. Another kindness that I ask from you is to allow me to read my address. And I'll tell you why. If I start talking off the cuff, I'm going to be here. <laughs> so, yeah. so be kind. Be kind and allow me to address you by reading my uh, address. Good evening, everybody. I enjoyed that study, by the way, wherever the chef is. And um, I think it also infused me with the energy that I will uh, need to address you, hopefully briefly. Um, another kind of news that I ask from the family and to all you friends,
having left his country of birth at the tender age of 13 in pursuit of freedom. The legendary human rights lawyer and anti-apartheid fighter he had become in South Africa. He had shown his enduring and selfless humanism with his uncompromising devotion to social justice and human dignity for all. Right into the tenth decade of his life, imagine. Watching him from the bench, making his submissions in the softest tones, in the softest tones, making the case and arguing for his clients has always been a real privilege for me to experience. As my comrade in the group, of advocates for social cohesion, I have seen him regarded as the ever sage, notwithstanding his typical self-effacing manner as he would be mingling with the youngest. And I could always see how he was held in the highest esteem by everybody. Throughout his life, his lifelong service at the Legal Resources Center where he had the privilege to amplify the voices of some of the most vulnerable and marginalized in our land. We will always cherish his work. We continue to appreciate who he was and what he had meant for South Africa. For so many reasons, including in the context of today's migration challenges in the continent as a whole, the life of George Bezos, in my view, is inspiring and it demands to be repeatedly told. Now, having said that, those of us who had uh, been around at the advent of our democracy will recall how, notwithstanding the conflicting positions we took on the struggle for our liberation and the liberation of the people of South Africa as a whole. The various sectors of society, including civil society, have gathered around and engaged on critical sector-related issues they would want, and at times even demanded to see included in the negotiated political settlement which culminated in the internal constitution. Similarly, later, as the constitution-making process uh, proceeded, some of those issues continued to be taken into account as they were fed into the constitution-making process. Indeed, the debates were difficult, we all know, and sometimes quite heated, but exciting, you will recall. The commitment to carve out a society based on the foundation of a new democratic constitution which defined the ethical direction of the future was palpable. The contribution of ideas by a strong and well-organized civil society community Researchers and information-based institutions with some attached to academic institutions found their way into the constitution-making process. The submissions were generally well-intended, somewhat benevolent, I must say, sincere and credible. Remember the boldness of the adoption of the principle of the power of judicial review, which would check and balance parliamentary legislative power and executive power, ensuring that none would be exercised in violation of the Constitution. Through the power of judicial review, unconstitutional legislation and the unconstitutional exercise of executive power including government policy, would be declared unconstitutional and set aside by the courts of law. 
You probably recall too the audacity that later went into the adoption of social economic rights as justiciable rights rather than as mere policy directives or government guidelines in the manner of the Constitution of India at the time, which ahead of any other constitution went only as far as constitutionalizing directive principles of government regulations and policy. As Chief Justice Ismail Muhammad once said, Muhammad, sorry, once said, the power of judicial review is the power given to the judiciary by parliament itself on behalf of the people of South Africa who parliament represents. That power he had reminded the judicial training seminar he was addressing at the time must be exercised without fear, without favor, without um, prejudice. Now, whereas in apartheid South Africa, the doctrine of the sovereignty of parliament, which is concomitant with its concomitant supremacy of legislation, had always been viewed as um, the foundation for the ever-widening gap between apartheid laws and justice. In the new democratic dispensation, however, we were to hold the state to the highest standards. We believed it, we agreed, and we included that in the provisions of the Constitution. For that reason, the Constitution in Section 7.2 today places an obligation on Parliament, Government, and the Judiciary, that is all three arms of the state, to respect, to protect, to promote and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights, of course subject to the institutional limitations that are placed on um, the fulfillment or enjoyment of these rights. The fulfillment and realization of the rights in the Bill of Rights is therefore a constitutional duty which is placed not only on the judiciary, but first on Parliament who, in its lawmaking role, must be fully informed of the needs of the people passing legislation to meet those needs wherever it is necessary. The executive or government as the executing or implementation or implementing arm of the state must, through policy and strategic programs, implement parliamentary legislation and account to parliament, where parliament has a constitutional duty to hold government accountable. Now it is when parliament and government fail in their constitutional obligations and complaints or disputes in that regard are brought before the courts that the judiciary will be involved adjudicating over the complaints or dispute disputes, pardon me. It is in that regard that the judiciary will play its adjudicative role and fulfill its constitutional obligation to respect, to protect, to promote and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights, taking into account the applicable constitutional rights limitations. The three arms of government must therefore perform that constitutional duty, the constitutional duty that they have. In particular, the courts must uh, do so, as I said earlier, without fearing, without favoring, and without prejudicing any of the parties, confirming or declaring parliamentary legislation or government action unconstitutional, if needs be. 
the courts will also, if they so find that uh, government action or parliamentary legislation are unconstitutional, set them aside. When making their orders for parliament or government to take corrective action, the duty of courts to refrain from judicial overreach, encroaching on parliamentary or executive powers is critical to maintain the well-being of any democracy. It is particularly important in the case of South Africa, where the judicial review power of the courts still evokes relative discomfort. When exercising the judicial adjudicative function, personal position on the issues at hand is irrelevant. There's no room for populism. A court's decision must be cogently reasoned based on the submissions of the parties, the provisions of and the values in the Constitution, and the applicable law must be lucidly interpreted and applied to the relevant facts and circumstances of each case. Often, pertinent surrounding social justice issues or social circumstances serve as context. And it is for that reason that people sometimes make reference that no two cases are ever the same. Any misinterpretation and or misapplication of um, the relevant facts and or the law, including the Constitution itself, is subject to judicial review or an appeal for a higher court. Where the court's order is subjected to strict judicial scrutiny of the facts and the law, and that function too, ladies and gentlemen, must be exercised independently, and again, without fear, without favor, without prejudice. The earlier decision may um, also be set aside and replaced with an appropriate order of uh, the higher court. Now, the judgments may contribute to judicial precedent, and those judgments generally published in worldwide law reports which are accessible to the critical eye of judicial peers, the legal profession, the academy, thought leaders in general, and the watchful eye of the public at large. Besides, the adjudicative process of the courts is performed in open court. The principal consistency in the interpretation and application of the law based on uh, judicial precedent is ever present in the process. Any unduly strained and or incorrect application and or interpretation adopted for a particular undue purpose can be easily detected. Any impropriety on the part of a judicial officer in that regard is reportable to the Judicial Services Commission and may become the subject of disciplinary action taken against a particular judicial officer. A risk, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me, not worth taking in the life of any judicial officer. If the decision is that of uh, the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in the land, the shared reasoning of collective decision-making, which of course accommodates the freedom of individual judicial thought and decision-making, resolves the issue of finality. The judiciary therefore has no constitutional mandate or jurisdiction to take up and decide social issues by themselves, no matter how dire the social justice circumstances. It, however, does not follow that the social context of the issues which come before the courts shall be disregarded. The 
contextual interpretation of the relevant facts and the applicable law in every case is an integral part of judicial reasoning and judicial decision making. When relevant, no, decision making when relevant. In other words, um, in every case, social context of the facts at issue is uh, an integral part of the judicial decision making process when those uh, facts are relevant. And uh, the social context of the matters at hand can also prominently impact the resolution of the dispute itself and the ultimate decision and order that the court will make. However, when the court's decision is precedent setting, it can bring positive change to relevant social justice concerns in broader society. But any suggestion that courts have an obligation to change the social justice landscape for vulnerable communities outside of the judicial process is, at the least, misleading. Indeed, the fact of rights protected in a Bill of Rights cannot by themselves make the rights our everyday reality. It is their substantive and effective implementation by all three arms of the state as they have each been mandated in the Constitution, which stands a chance of uh, making real the rights in the Constitution for people. However, what is also necessary in the implementation of rights is the need for the state, all three arms of the state, to have the necessary capacity and capability to substantively and effectively narrow the gap between the rights in the Bill of Rights and our everyday lives. The realization of the rights in the Bill of Rights will otherwise continue to elude us. Now almost three decades of the operation of a constitution with the Bill of Rights, including the justiciability of social economic rights, we continue to grapple with social justice challenges, which can do. The violence in our country, in particular, gender-based violence, the violence against children, the poverty, abject poverty, if you may, the corruption, which deeply impacts quality of life of people in general. I can go on and on. And this despite the fact that we have had an operational constitution for almost 30 years. And it is for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, that we must understand and believe that the protection of rights in the Constitution by themselves is not the answer. We need implementation, implementation, we need the capacity, we need the capability to do so. And poverty cannot be alleviated by the fact of the protection of social economic rights in our Constitution, of course. We need an economic system well developed to provide for the alleviation of poverty. We cannot 
simply by the constitutional protection of labor rights, ensure that people have jobs. It is more to be done. And it is the warm bodies which implement the constitution which must ensure that the promises made in the constitution are realized. And it is the obligation of all three arms of the state, judiciary, which must play its role, the role that it has, other than implementing the laws that are passed by the parliament to ensure there is access to justice. Warm bodies which serve in the legal profession must find a way in ensuring that the costs of legal services is not prohibitable. And those are examples that must show us that protecting rights by itself is not sufficient. And we will come to the state, all three arms of the state, we will come to civil society, to ask for support in alleviating the difficulties, the challenges that we face as a society, as a people, notwithstanding the beauty of our constitution which protects even social and economic rights. So innovatively, with the audacity, the necessary audacity, because we understand and know where we are coming. has to work for people. The gap, unacceptable gap between the ultra wealthy and the abjectly poor must be narrowed. And all of that that we need to achieve that. We have to place people at the center of our services, the rights that are protected in the government. And it is in that context that I would like to remind us of the circumstances which we were faced with at the advent of our democracy. When we believed in each other and believed that if we come together and uh, engage with each other on the issues that have to be resolved by carving out a democratic dispensation for ourselves, will work for us as the people of South Africa. I think we must still believe that notwithstanding the weaknesses and of course whatever strengths we have and we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Our constitution as it stands has a number of strengths and weaknesses which can enable us to make real the promises and vision in the Constitution. We must have the will to do that. We must have the capability to do that. We must have the capacity to do that. And each arm of the law has a mandate in the Constitution and must meet and fulfill its mandate serving people and placing people right at the center, as I say. Now, then Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo 
makes a number of observations and recommendations which point to the need for a number of structural changes which must be uh, made, among others, which the state might have to embark upon to enhance the capacity and capability uh, of the state with a view to keep uh, state capture at bay or the recurrence of state capture at bay. That, in my view, will permit the nation to move forward in future. But it would require of us, as we make those changes and regroup, making inputs, sectoral inputs, into the reason for regrouping and the activities uh, uh, of the regrouping place the people at the center of state interest generally and state services in particular. And that must be a national concern. We must all be concerned as uh, Tanji said earlier, to bring back or to take back our state. We need to do that. And it will require all of us to come together as a nation and all of us without marginalizing any sector of our society in the same way that we did in 1994, when we put our differences aside and came together and carved out a democratic dispensation for us. I know that some things have changed, some have changed a lot. But it is important for us to come together again. Different sectors have intersectoral engagements, intergenerational, all-inclusive. We find a way of getting our state back. And while I just sit and wonder what Dr. George would have thought about such a wild thought, Please think about it. Thank you for listening. that you made earlier, and congratulations once again to the Justice.